sound sensitivity, I like to call it hypersensitivity sounds syndrome, meaning that someone's hypersensitive to sound. So I was in a car accident when I was 14 and over the years, you know, just developed different symptoms. So one of the symptoms, and it's a very odd symptom and you can kind of understand it once I explain it. So there's rare occasions now where I'll wake up and I'll have an echoing of my own voice. So you hear your voice and then it's like in an echo chamber. The echoing is part of autophony. Autophony is when one's own voice is too loud or echoing. So I've had autophony. Hyperacusis is when there's a hypersensitivity to sound. So I've had people come in and you know, I tend to, when I get excited, I tend to have a loud voice. So I've definitely had people where the whole room has to be very, very silent and they have uh, earplugs in and you could just see the stress on their face because imagine at any moment, if somebody speaks, even in a normal voice, you're gonna hear like, ah! you'll hear this unbelievable loud sound. And maybe the closest thing we all can get to that is Mary and I have always had cats. You know, we've had cats and I grew up with cats. Cats in nature, their defense mechanism is speed running away. So they're, they're just hypersensitivity to sound and something very lightly can drop on the ground and they'll go like that. So imagine if you had the sound sensitivity of a cat. So any sound or even a reasonably loud sound was horrifically loud. Just imagine the trauma that would cause you. And if this is you, I'm making this video just to let you know, you definitely can get better with it. So I'm going to explain what I believe causes it and how to get rid of it. Misophony is any strong dislike for certain sounds. So there's even people where, you know, we all know like the scratching of fingernails on a chalkboard. Like, so imagine if, you know, the sound of uh, a newspaper, you know, would make you just cringe and, and, and just have uh, unbelievable stress. So, there's lots of different hypersensitivity sound syndromes. And this is kind of the key to it. So you have the malleus bone that connects to your tympanic membrane. So you have the external auditory canal, sound goes into it, right? It reaches your tympanic membrane, which vibrates, right? So the vibration of your tympanic membrane vibrates the malleus inca stapes, and then that vibration causes an electrical current in your cochlear vestibular nerve. The cochlea, the cochlea is the organ of hearing, and then that gets transferred to the brain, and the brain lets you hear. So most autophony misophonia, hyperacusis, or hypersensitivity to sound is because the muscles that are to dampen sound, they're not working. And you might say, well, why aren't they working? They're not working because the uh, nerve supply to those muscles is hampered. So the muscles aren't able to contract like they should. You don't realize like we have muscles that dampen the sound of your own voice. Because if we didn't have those muscles, me speaking to you in the level of sound, the decibels of sound that I have now, it would be deafening to you. It would be so loud. So I just want to read this. Muscles involved in the attenuation or decrease of sound. The tensor tympani muscle and stapedius muscle are innervated by the trigeminal and facial nerves respectively. They contract to help us tolerate loud sounds. When these muscles contract, vibrations are lessened to the cochlea. The cochlea is the organ of hearing. The vestibular, the semicircular canals, that's how you handle balance. You know, that's the organ of balance. This is the organ of hearing. 
So when these muscles contract, vibrations are lessened to the cochlea of the inner ear. When a person has atlantoaxial instability affecting these muscles, the person can be sensitive to any noise, even the sound of their own voice. So basically when these two muscles don't contract, a person can't dampen sound. So then they get hypersensitivity to sound. And this kind of just shows it. So let me just say you have the tympanic membrane, malleus inca stapes, the stapes goes on to the cochlea. Then there's muscles that contract to dampen the sound or the vibrations. Now, the tensor tympani muscle, that's innervated by the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve five. And the stapedius muscle, that's innervated by cranial nerve seven, which is the facial nerve. This just shows you, I mean, it's a little bit uh, complicated, but it's basically shows you like you have the stapes here, you have the corda tympani membrane, or you have the corda tympani nerve that's from the facial nerve, which will innervate the uh, stapedius muscle, which dampens sound. So when the facial nerve is affected, like you have cervical destruction or cervical instability causing a decrease in the cerebral spinal fluid flow. And if that flow causes extra fluid to go around the facial nerve or the trigeminal nerve, that can attenuate or dampen the amount of impulses that go through the facial nerve or the uh, trigeminal nerve. And the trigeminal nerve, when the impulses don't go through, the tensor tympani muscle may not work so good. And when that or the facial nerve doesn't innervate the muscles in the ear, then of course you end up getting a uh, sound sensitivity. And you might say, well, there are, are there any other symptoms? Like how would I know if I have sound sensitivity and it's related to the neck? And you guys have heard me say this a million times on these, on these videos is, well, do you have clicking, popping, grinding in the neck? Do you manipulate the neck? Did you get, did this occur after you had a high velocity manipulation? Did it occur after you were studying a lot or you were on the computer for a long period of time and you got a change in your neck curve? Uh, did, do you have muscle tension? Do you have trigeminal neuralgia? Do you have numbness in the face, numbness in the tongue? Do you have dizziness? Um, do you have swallowing difficulties? Do you have other signs and symptoms of cervical instability? If you do, I would get a uh, evaluation for cervical instability. And if it's found, I would consider getting prolotherapy. The only reason why I put this in here, see where it says cranial nerve seven, I know it's hard to see, but you'll see that the facial nerve runs right by the atlas, which is C1. That's why I believe that one of the main structural causes of sound sensitivity, even Bell's palsy, which is a facial nerve palsy, is a atlas misalignment, atlas instability, or what we call upper cervical instability. If you see here, facial nerve, sensitivity to sounds, you can get metallic taste, change in taste. Trigeminal nerve, if you, because if you have trigeminal nerve involved, that can also give you sound sensitivity, but it also can give you migraine headaches, decreased hearing, ear fullness, dizziness, trigeminal neuralgia, facial pain, double vision. So if you have some of those other symptoms, you really have to have an evaluation for upper cervical instability. This just kind of shows you the, the trigeminal nerve innervates the muscles, you know, of the of uh, the muscles of mastication. So it's it the trigeminal nerve is sensation of the face, sensation of the tongue, uh, and then the muscles of chewing. So that's the trigeminal nerve. The facial nerve is smiling. That's why when you have a, fa a Bell's palsy, you know, you can't smile on one side. So if somebody has sound sensitivity and you have other symptoms suggestive of facial nerve palsy or trigeminal nerve palsy, definitely encourage you to get evaluation for cervical instability. The way we check for cervical instability is we do a digital motion x-ray and we do cone beam CT scan. The 
cause of sound sensitivity in some people has a structural etiology. The structural etiology, in my experience, is upper cervical instability and a breakdown of the cervical curve called cervical destructure. The good news is that many people can be helped significantly if the curve is corrected and the instability is resolved with prolotherapy.